Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Marvel's Eternals. A literally groundbreaking game changer with scales so epic that even the main characters are like, whoa, do we need all of us for this? I loved how this movie redefined the mythology and the rules of the MCU, so I am gonna break this down scene by scene for all of the Easter eggs, visual details, cinematic influences, and deeper layers of meaning that you might have missed. By the way, you can support New Rockstars by checking out our Eternals inspired latest obsession shirt, Immortal Unity with a really cool art deco design at NewRockStarsMerch.com. Available only for a limited time though. There's also a fearsome celestial shirt available. Check out all of our great options at NewRockStarsMerch.com. The film opens with the words, in the beginning. Just that text, simply on black. Which, of course, the first three words of the Bible. Establishing this film as its own Book of Genesis origin story for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. There's mention of the universe's first son and Arishem, a celestial, the god of this universe. And and when ecological disaster wipes out our civilization so that all that's left is a Disney Plus subscription watched by a WALL-E robot, what advanced alien races think our god is too? This Star Wars-esque scroll says the Celestials came before the Six Singularities and the Dawn of Creation, referring to the Infinity Stones that Wong explained were created by the Big Bang, meaning the Celestials predated the Big Bang and might have created the Infinity Stones and were likely unaffected by Thanos' snap. The number six, apparently sacred to the MCU, might have even been rooted in the Celestials having their six eyes. Celestials were Marvel Comics creations of Jack Kirby, their giant armored space gods who created mankind on Earth alongside Eternals and Deviants. In Guardians of the Galaxy, we briefly saw the Celestial East on the Searcher, and nowhere is the severed head of a Celestial, and Peter Quill's father, Ego, claimed to be a Celestial as well. Here we meet the Ten Eternals as they float past the sun in their ship called the Domo. In the Eternals comics, Domo was actually the name of an Eternal who administered the affairs on Olympia, answering directly to Zuras, Thena's father. He used to be a secretary, now he's a ship that gets wrecked. Nomo Domo. But we already know something is different about the Eternals origin story in this film because they arrived to Earth already manufactured. We later hear that they think they come from a separate planet called Olympia, when in the comics, the Celestials create the Eternals on Earth from genetic experiments alongside humans and deviants. And Olympia is a place on Earth as well. Ooh, baby, do you know what that's worth? So seeing them just delivered here and then booted up, all just little clues that these are actually synthetic beings with no real genetic history alongside humanity, and we're just fed this false narrative. Throughout all this, composer Ramin Jawadi scores the imagery with haunting organ music, evoking Hans Zimmer's organ score for Interstellar, both of which cast all this cosmic imagery with the tones of a church, inviting us to behold these sacred events with reverence and awe. The Domo looms into view upon ancient Mesopotamia 5000 BC, director Chloe Zhao's imagery showing the Domo in profile as a rectangular shape evokes the mysterious arrival of the monolith in Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, which symbolically served the same function as the Domo does here. Advanced tech coming from above, allowing early humans to finally evolve. An amphibious deviant washes up, much like the seminal first fish that jumped from water to land in our evolutionary history. But unlike the deviants in the comics, these have a silvery, wispy anatomy, like the barbs of a catfish. It's gonna sting ya! And it's all strung together into these mythological forms, like griffins and dragons. And notice how they come with a second set of eyes, four in total, which links them visually to the Celestials, whose helmets have six eye circles. The Deviants just being one rung below from that. And then Eternals and humans one rung below that with just the two eyes. Just another cool detail hinting that the Deviants were also crafted in the Celestials image, and might have, in a way, at one point been preferred. This fisherman calmly tells his son to run, sacrificing himself to save his boy. It's just interesting how, despite the Eternals' divine gifts after gifts, really the best, most noble qualities about humanity are already evident in these humans. The Eternals help them repel the Deviants, each using their powers in different ways. Like we see Icarus's flight and laser vision, Makari's super speed, Kingo's finger gun energy blast, Cersei's matter transfiguration, Thena's casting of weapons, Gilgamesh's power punches, Fastos's tech assembly, Sprite's illusion casting, Druig's mind control, and then Ajax, last but not least, heals Icarus's wounds. And notice how whenever they use their powers, they all 
all kind of take the same form. A glow of golden cosmic magic emanating from the contours of their armor. And actually, you can even see Makari's trailing behind her as she zips that boy to safety, almost like a puppet string. Just a way of showing how all of this is just rooted from the Celestials, like a string of Christmas lights, all strung from the same wall outlet. They say goodbye by giving this boy this dagger. This is actually a real life ceremonial golden dagger recovered from the Sumerian port city of Ur in a royal tomb. So making this village that very civilization, the Sumerians were the earliest known civilization of ancient Mesopotamia, living among the Tigris and Euphrates river valleys, which was one of four major waterways on earth that early civilizations arose upon, along with the Nile, the Indus, and the Yellow River. This film suggests that the spark that enabled all of human civilization to ignite was the eternal arrival and Zhao frames that spark with this handoff evoking Michelangelo's creation of Adam God on the right man on the left the Marvel Studios title card actually opens with a quick flash of Kirby's comic depictions of the six-eyed celestial we also see Shang-Chi added to the M of Marvel Studios and then we hear the music of Pink Floyd's time the opening track to their epic album dark side of the moon really the best song to just space out to the lyrics lament losing track of time kicking around on a piece of the ground waiting for someone or something to show you the way just like how the eternals have been stuck on earth burning time centuries millennia waiting for further instructions from the celestials Cersei's now in London working at the Natural History Museum where that Sumerian dagger is now a relic on display on her way into work she greets Charles Darwin whose theory on evolution might have been eternal inspired she also gives an apprehensive look at a dinosaur fossil almost as if these previous apex predators on earth might might have become prey to their mortal enemies, the Deviants. In a classroom, Dane Whitman quotes the poet Walt Whitman. In this broad earth of ours, amid the measureless grossness and slag, enclosed and safe within its central heart, nestles the seed of perfection. Going on to say that the poet's optimism in humanity echoes our recent universal victory, the return of half our population. Of course, he's referencing the events of the blip in Avengers Endgame, but also this quote foreshadows how in our earth, within its heart, nestles the seed of a celestial. Cersei, of course, lectures about apex predators foreshadowing the return of the apex predators at deviance then at dane's birthday party cersei gives dane a ring that he notices from the middle ages and it bears a raven emblem dane whitman becomes in the comics the black knight a successor to a long line of warriors who all bear the ebony blade the first bearer being dane's ancestor sir percy of scandia who lived during the reign of king arthur cersei says this raven is his family crest in the comics black knight's chest plate bears a raven emblem dane asks cersei are you a wizard like Doctor Strange? I'm super normal. Cersei's powers come from the Celestials, but the eldritch magic of Doctor Strange and the Sorcerers may very well come from the same source. Later, actually, Cersei transfigures a boulder into birds, visually similar to how Doctor Strange turned one of Thanos' attacks into butterflies in Infinity War. The Deviant attacks them in Camden Lock, and Sprite tries to distract it by casting duplicates of herself and Cersei. Though notice how when the Deviant knocks her down, it breaks the illusion and the duplicates fade away. Now, Sprite's duplicates aren't tangible like the duplicates that Loki can cast with his sorcery. So Icarus arrives to help and Cersei turns a crashing double-decker bus into rose petals. Cersei finally admits to Dane the truth about the Eternals' history, claiming her understanding that she came from a planet called Olympia, and Dane asks, Why didn't you guys help fight Thanos? Or any war, or all the other terrible things throughout history? We were instructed not to interfere in any human conflicts unless deviants are involved. She goes on to say that had they protected humanity from everything, mankind would never develop the way that they were meant to. And to be clear, Thanos is an Eternal born with a deviant gene. He is the son of Alars, who was brother to Zeros, Thena's father. And Thanos was also the brother to Eros, aka a Star Fox, as confirmed in the post credit scene. But it sounds like these Eternals were kept in the dark, mostly on Earth, so they would probably have no reason to know Thanos' Eternal or his deviant lineage. Dane hears the name Icarus and incites the Greek myth of Icarus who flew too close to the sun, and Cersei confirms that Sprite made up that myth when they were in Athens. So all of the Eternals really have analogs in real world history, like Icarus inspired the tragedy of Icarus, Thena inspired Athena, Greek goddess of war and leader of Athens, Phastos inspired Hephaestos, Greek god of the forge, Circe inspired Circe from Greek mythology in the Odyssey, who transforms humans into animals. Ajax inspired Ajax, the hero 
second only to Achilles. Gilgamesh inspired the great epic of Gilgamesh from Sumerian mythology, considered the oldest narrative of human history. Sprite inspired figures like sprites from European mythology, but also, as stated in this film, Tinkerbell, which is a nod of the comics, in which Sprite actually visits playwright J.M. Barry and inspired him for his character of Peter Pan. Kingo may have been linked with King Gu from Babylonian mythology, and Druig doesn't really seem to have a mythological link, but his name does sound like the Russian word Drug for friend? Maybe the way he sees himself as a friend of humanity? But back in Cersei and Sprite's flat, MCU news outlet WHIH shows back up on the TV reporting on the global earthquakes, and Sprite unsheaths this blade, the same blade she later uses to stab Cersei in the back during the final battle. We flash back to the city of Babylon in 575 BC. The film actually reconstructed the famous Ishtar Gate, currently on display at the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, and after they slay this deviant, Ajax is summoned by the celestial Ereshim the Judge. I love how visually Chloe Zhao achieves this awesome scale with Ereshim's whole design. Asteroids and other space dust orbiting his massive form. Also notice how his armor in many places appears scratched, crumbled, weathered, giving him a semblance of age and life experience, at least compared to Jemiah's cleaner armor in the later shot. Like these might be battle scars from a kind of conflict that left nowhere beheaded. This first shot of Ereshim actually only shows part of his enormous head, like it's impossible for us to take him in all at once, but they personify him only through his voice and these six glowing eye holes. So later in the film, as Tiamat emerges and Ereshim returns in judgment, just those six eyes alone signal to us how massive these things are in full. Now the Domo is parked inside of the city of Babylon, inside the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Two other ancient wonders, the Lighthouse of Alexandria and the Pyramids of Giza, appeared in the MCU in Loki. At the feast, Sprite regales them in what sounds like the actual epic of Gilgamesh, as Makari barters for the Emerald Tablet, which is a real-world relic containing cryptic hermetic text, which has been obsessed over by Islamic and European alchemists who associated it with the Philosopher's Stone as a means of producing gold, but it contains the famous derived passage of As Above, So Below, which is interesting to think about the context of the Celestials, right? As they are above, so they are below our feet, sleeping. And that Celestial, Tiamat, begins gold, but is turned back into an elemental form of marble stone, ironic considering Dane calls Cersei King Midas later on. Icarus and Cersei declare their love for each other, they get it on, and they get married in the Gupta Empire of Impia in 480. There's actually a quick shot of the Great Wall of India at Kumbhalgar, the second longest wall in the world after the Great Wall of China. I like how in the shot of the other Eternals cheering on their wedding, Sprite looks pissed with envy, of course, and Thena gives an apprehensive stare as she never fully trusted Icarus. Cersei, Sprite, and Icarus arrive at Ajax, South Dakota Ranch. Icarus is the last one to walk up, though probably since he knows what they're gonna find there. Then the speak and spear floats up from Ajax's corpse to Cersei, and now Ersham tells Cersei, it's almost time to be disqualified. Then we flash back to Tenochtitlan. Sorry if I said that wrong, 1521 AD. This was the great capital of the Aztec Empire that was sacked by Spanish forces led by conquistador Hernan Cortes in this year. Another important historical turning point in human history, it allows Spain and other European powers to end up dominating the Americas. Thanks, smallpox. Oh my God, I just realized that's the same way Florida is gonna conquer all of us. Anyway, seeing these Spanish soldiers wipe out the Aztecs with firearms, the Eternals debate intervention and then Thena suffers a breakdown from Mad Weary, which they later define as one's mind fracturing under the weight of memories. Like, you know, anytime you think about high school and the spiraling begins, the skateboarders were so cruel, we're all gonna die! Ajax offers to wipe Thena's memory, but Gilgamesh says he will seclude her and watch over her, and then Druig splits off by making the Spanish and Aztecs drop their weapons and follow him into the jungle. They track down Kingo on the set of a Bollywood film in Mumbai, and he tells them his movie is The Legend of Icarus, thus his costume matching Icarus's old design. And he introduces my favorite character in the movie, Karu. Actually, when we first met, he thought I was a vampire, and he tried to stake me through the heart. I have apologized so many times. Not quite enough times, very close to. I guess another MCU vampire mention after one we heard in Loki. You know, we brought in Kree, Titans, vampires. Why is it the two orphan demigods are such a just interesting how vampires are increasingly becoming a thing in the MCU, setting the stage for Blade to exist at some point. A promise that gets delivered in the final seconds of the post credit scene with a vocal cameo by Mahershala Ali as the MCU's Blade. Kingo joins them despite having a sequel to shoot and he mentions how they just got BTS to do a cameo, which I feel like has gotta be a meta nod to the pop star cameo in this movie's post credit scene of a superhero franchise. On Kingo's private jet, he collects Captain America's original shield from the first Cap film 
He also shows his movie posters in which he poses multiple generations of his own phony dynasty, like his great grandfather, his grandfather's father, etc. The movies include titles like Yuva Prim, Taliko, Kel, and Phantom Gun. Looks like a 007 type movie. But notice how he changed up the facial hair of each generation. And if you think about it, this would have been under a hundred years of history. So five generations means that Kingo refused to wait too long before reintroducing himself as like a younger, better looking son. It's so funny. He like craves the spotlight that much. Cersei tells Kingo in Karun's documentary that she can turn rock into water, rock into wood, and rock into metal. Could be a bit of foreshadowing in the final act when she transformed the gold colored metal back into marble rock. But also maybe you could see this as a way that she could have helped turn rock into vibranium with her and Bastos helping the Wakandans in various ways. Now, before I continue, getting called sir or ma'am or dude is not as cool as getting called lord or lady. Established Titles is a project based on a historic Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lairds or lords and ladies in English. They let people buy as little as one square foot of dedicated land so that they can call themselves a lord or a lady. And in return, Established Titles commits to planting a tree. It's just a fun way to help preserve the beautiful woodlands and biodiversity of Scotland while raising funds to support global conservation efforts. Established Titles work with global charity Trees for the Future and One Tree Planted to help them plant a tree for every order. Plus, for those with Scottish heritage, it's a great way to connect to your family roots. Or just a great fun option to give as a gift for a loved one. So this is the title I got. I, I, I'm getting a real kick out of this. Your title packs give you a numbered plot of dedicated land on a private estate in the medieval capital city of Scotland and an official certificate with a crest. And uh, here's a map where it is. They have a special Lordship, Ladyship, and Kingdom of Scotland bundle, which features a hand-drawn map of Scotland by famed cartographer John Speed. They're also running a special early Black Friday sale. So go to establishedtitles.com slash new rockstars and get 10% off any orders. That's establishedtitles.com slash new rockstars or click the link in the description. In Australia, they find the corpse of a deviant that Gilgamesh had killed recently. Karun thinks it's beautiful, showing how beauty truly is a matter of perspective, but also making me suspect that Karun could be a scroll who on the scroll planet evolved from the deviant race. Keep an eye on that one. Gilgamesh compares Karun to Alpha in Batman, one of two references to DC superheroes in this movie. Dad, that's Superman with the cape and you're shooting laser beams out of your eye. Now, obviously the MCU references uh, external pop culture all the time, but DC references in particular almost never come up in the MCU since Iron Man in 2008, aside from a very quick Super Friends reference in Iron Man 3. But as I explained in a recent video and confirmed by director Chloe Zhao, Eternals is all about embracing superhero mythology in general, like famous DC characters and characters like Thor, all rooted in in our world and in this world in historical folklore and Jungian archetypes. Then suffering a bit of mad weary, Thena remembers one of the past planets they helped the Celestials destroy, saying, everyone in Century 6 is going to die. It's too late. We can't save them. Century 6 is actually a lesser planet from Marvel Comics, a planet whose population ends up getting sold into slavery. Gilgamesh and Kingo both use Odin's name in place of God, and then Kingo mentions Thor. Thor used to follow me around when he was a little kid. Now he's a famous Avenger and won't return my calls. <laughs> Meaning Thor and other Asgardians may be aware of the Eternals on Earth. Sprite Solutions did earlier show a Viking ship and 575 BC would have been long before Norse Vikings on Earth were ever around. So she might have been referencing their friends, the Asgardians. And these two groups of people might have known each other. Which makes us now wonder, what are the Celestials' relationship with the Asgardians? In the Marvel comics, the Asgardians were a special group that the Celestials created from an extra mutation cycle designed to reflect the mythology of the people they protect. So we'll see if this history comes up in Thor Love and Thunder with characters like Gore the God Butcher, who carries a special sword that, in the comics, did sever the head of the Celestial Nowhere. And they bring up the Avengers. So now that Captain Rogers and Iron Man are both gone, who do you think's gonna lead the Avengers? I could lead them. <laughs> yeah, they tell Icarus that Ajax didn't even choose him to lead them. And Icarus laughs it off, but he does seem a bit stung. I think it's because he still feels pretty guilty about what he did to Ajax. It's also interesting that Sprite just called Steve Captain Rogers, meaning they must have been aware of him back in the 40s when he was still an army soldier. Maybe also a nod to the fact that Captain America in the MCU is now technically Sam Wilson. Arishem reveals the dark truth to Cersei, that the emergence is the hatching of a sleeping celestial nestled inside Earth called Tiamat, and that all the 
celestials are born by gestating inside host planets, feeding on the energy of the planet's life forms, and then emerge when they reach a critical energy level. And then the celestials recycle that energy to create new suns and new galaxies. So Tiamat being secretly buried inside Earth comes directly from the Marvel comics, in which Tiamat the Dreaming Celestial arises from under San Francisco. Also gotta say, nice to call one accurately for a change. Arashem shows him crashing up through the crust of the Earth shortly after the planet's population resurges after Bruce Banner ended the blip in Avengers Endgame. And in that moment, you can see specific population centers suddenly repopulating, including a little bright spot on Wakanda. As Tiamat's giant hand reaches up through the surface, you can see the city electrical grids suddenly flickering out. Just a frightening example of scale in the billions of lives that would have been lost. Ereshim also reveals that the Eternals are not from the planet Olympia, but they are actually memoryless synthetic beings sent to host planets with celestial seeds in order to make sure intelligent life continues to evolve, protecting that life from the Deviants, whom the Celestials also created, initially sent to clear out the Apex Predators on that planet. Ereshim mentions losing control of the Deviants as they evolved, and we see what looks like some scrolls. These shape-shifting scrolls were actually the deviant race on that planet, thus the link with the deviants more or less develop shape-shifting abilities in this movie. The Eternals are constructed in a world forge that stores their memories from past lives. Cersei actually sees an assembly line of her past selves, production design evoking the partly formed AI robots in the movie Ex Machina. So at this point in the movie may be where Eternals either loses you or hooks you. For me, hook, line, and sinker. I mean, similar to the way Terrence Malick's Tree of Life departs its earthbound drama for a macroscopic interlude halfway through the movie, this sudden expository spectacle is designed to stun and to overwhelm us, make us ask ourselves, well, what do we matter then? And in the case of the story, to shock Cersei into blind, trembling obedience, just like our Book of Genesis is really designed to do, folks. <sighs> Waiting for someone or something to show you the way. <laughs> really posing this movie's deeper question. Can one's purpose be defied for love? A debate that plays out among the Eternals. Kingo argues, we're not the bad guys, we did our jobs. One thing I really love about this movie, the conflict arises from everyone pursuing their purpose, be it survival, reproduction, or protection. It's an elemental Darwinian struggle, a battle of justifiable ideals. It actually evokes a classic Greek drama, like Aeschylus's The Eumenides, and we which immortal Greek gods debate the sins and worthiness of the human mortals. It's the same debate of free will versus determinism playing out with Loki and Kang, with the Watcher of What If, and it raises the bar of intellect in the MCU and I am here for it. Ultimately, Cersei sides with the rationale Cap used in Infinity War, that the lives of others are never worth trading, therefore the emergence must be stopped. And they find Druig in a remote village of the Amazon, mind controlling humans, an idyllic cult free from conflict. It's actually kind of fun to see how humanity is evolving in its own micro microcosm there. There's a blacksmith hammering away, reminding us of Tony Stark in the cave in the first Iron Man. We hear Cersei's ringtone. It's Lizzo's juice. And Kingo and Druig face off. Kingo did movie star. I've directed some things too. Yeah, Kingo says he's made some online content, but doesn't do it for the views. Hey, neither do we, Kingo. Uh, I'm just kidding. We totally do it for the views. We are horny for views here. We are the arrows of views. Cersei tells Dane to call his uncle and make amends with him. A nod to Dane Whitman's uncle, Nathan Garrett in the comics, the previous Black Knight, who's actually a villainous character. Historically, the bear of the Ebony Blade, not a good guy, which is why Dane may not get along with him. In the comics, Dane actually inherits a castle from his uncle, and that's where he finds the Ebony Blade. In fact, I think that's where that second post credit scene is taking place place. Then deviants attack the village. Kingo uses his finger guns to explode one of their heads, while Cersei turns another into a tree, showing that she actually can transform sentient beings despite her belief otherwise. But the alpha deviant kills Gilgamesh and absorbs his life force, turning that deviant into a more humanoid talking form named Crow, the leader of the deviants in the comics, who's voiced by Pennywise actor Bill Skarsgård, who accuses the Eternals of hunting his kind, saying, you are not saviors, Eternals. You are murderers. And you'll float too! <laughs> But since Druig doesn't think he's powerful enough to mind control a whole celestial, they decide to seek out Fastos, whom we flash back to at the site of Hiroshima, August 8th, 1945, the day American forces dropped an atomic bomb on the city. And standing in the ashes, Ajax consoles Fastos, who cries, I did this if my technology hadn't helped in the past. Druig was right. This was a mistake. These people, they're not worth saving. His regret is based on that of J. Robert Oppenheimer, one of the scientists whose research led to the atomic bomb, something he deeply regretted and fiercely criticized 
criticized in his later years. Now, Fastos lives with his husband, Ben, and son, Jack, who mistakes Icarus for Superman. Fastos tells his family that their names are Isaac and Sylvia, a nod to their human aliases in the comics, Isaac Ike Harris and Sylvia Cersei. On the table is a Star Wars book. Now, Star Wars has already popped up in the MCU before. Peter Parker is obsessed with Star Wars. He cites Empire and Civil War. He collects Star Wars Legos and figurines. And then, of course, Cap lists Star Wars in his notebook. But here, along with the Superman reference, it's just another piece of pop culture rooted in eternal linked mythology. Like George Lucas definitely based Luke Skywalker's hero's journey on Arthurian legend, the same Arthur known by the Eternals and by Dane's ancestors. Testing the walls of Fastos' safe house, Icarus also tests the table. I bet you've built the perfect safe house. Well, what's this even made of? Vibranium? <laughs> For Icarus to assume Fastos made a table out of vibranium, just another example how things like what kind of vibranium tech might have been aided by Fastos. And he may have been the source who supplied Howard Stark with that vibranium for Cap's shield in World War II, but then maybe quit helping the United States defenses when they used his fission technology for the Manhattan Project. As Fastos leaves his family, Skeeter Davis's The End of the World plays, which we heard in the first trailer, and then they return to the Iraqi archaeological dig site, where the ruins of Babylon do rest in our world as a UNESCO World Heritage site. Here he raises the Domo from the earth and inside they find Makari, whom King Goat calls Miss Havisham, a reference to the crazy old hoarder from Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. Makari's wearing a shirt for H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. If you think about it, a pretty similar plot about extraterrestrial world enders who end up not being able to cut it because the germs on this planet are just too resistant. Now as a speedster, Makari has apparently just gathered various historical artifacts, including an ancient Egyptian statue of the deity Bastet, who is an influence on the Wakandan panther deity of Bast, a painting called Le Laison de Musique, which actually hangs in the Louvre, a Roman imperial eagle staff with SPQR, Senatus Populus K. Romanus, the People's Republic of Rome, a bundle of scrolls, maybe from the Lost Library of Alexandria, a Big Mac in its carton, the Holy Grail, the same design from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, a statue called the Chimera of Arezzo, which in real life resides in the National Archaeological Museum in Florence, a throne that I thought might have been the United Kingdom's St. Edward's chair, their throne, but it's not that one, it's just one similar to it, and a medieval suit of armor, one that you might find in the UK's Tower of London. Remember Happy Hogan and the rest using some of that armor to fend off the Stark drones. And then a PlayStation VR headset. Fina swings around a sword that Sprite thinks is the Ebony Blade. Again, Dane Whitman's Black Knight's family sword. But Fina corrects her, it's Excalibur, the sword of King Arthur from Legend. And Sprite says, well, Arthur always did have a crush on you. Meanwhile, the others trade Twinkies for the Emerald Tablet, showing that Makari did eventually get her hands on it. Bastos invents new bracelets to help them form the Unimind to hack Tiamat, which is a term for all the Eternals combining their consciousness into a big brain that can fight off other big forces in the comics. We flash back six days before when Icarus visited Ajax on her ranch where she tells him about the oncoming emergence and he's like, awesome, great, mission accomplished. Let's pack it out, boys. But she says, five years ago, Thanos delayed the emergence. Now, since we just learned that Thanos and his brother Eros were both Eternals of Titan, this may reframe Thanos' goal of erasing half of all life across the universe instead as a way of disrupting celestial reproduction. I've said it before, I'll say it again, Thanos did nothing wrong. He had a plan. The guy was on our side, had we only listened. But since Ajax was a softy who wanted to stop the emergence, Icarus transports her to the worst place on Earth, Alaska. <laughs> Just kidding, I've never been there. But there's a melted glacier with some oil workers being fed on by unfrozen deviants. But the deviants now attack Ajax, killing her, stealing her healing power, and then regrouping, spreading south. Now, as the emergence begins, Makari zips all around the world looking for that hatching point. I love the way they depict her speedster abilities in this movie. The world zips past her rapidly, including we see her past the Christ the Redeemer statue in Rio de Janeiro, as opposed to often how we see speedsters in other movies where they use relative slow motion to show super speed. Both look really cool. This is just a whole new way of showing it. I really appreciated it. And then she finds that point at an island in the Indian Ocean, and if you look behind her in the background, there are a couple oil platforms drilling away. I love this detail. It just gives this battle a backdrop of a reminder of just one way part of humanity doesn't care about this planet that the Eternals are fighting to save. Icarus reveals his betrayal of Ajax, and Sprite ends up siding with him. Of course she does. Now, now, Kingo, I thought was interesting, does side with Icarus in theory. He can't let go of his function, but out of not
not wanting to hurt his family, he benches himself from the fight. Sprite, who Houdini's herself in Icarus Out of Here, actually in the credits montage, there is a poster for a Houdini magic show with Sprite whispering in his ear, suggesting she might have influenced the great magician and escape artist. So backup plan, Bastos has to extract Cersei's fear as kind of a backdoor hack to Tiamat, setting up this final battle on the volcanic island. Icarus crashes the domo, Cersei stalls the eruption, Makari and Bastos use some awesome moves to pin Icarus to hold him down. Ajax seems to appear to Cersei, but it's all a trick by Sprite, who stabs her in the back and the druid club Sprite in the head. Thena battles Crow in a cave, manages to conjure blades to slice him apart, but still Tiamat emerges. It looks epic in scale. I loved how this looked, and Cersei has to combine her strength with the others of the Unimind to reverse Midas Tiamat and turn his golden form into marble. Icarus breaks free of Fastos' restraints and angrily fires his laser eyes into the sky, evoking an iconic frame of Icarus from the comics. Icarus watches this go down, and memories of Cersei rewind through their time together, back to their wedding day, back to Babylon, and to the first moment they set eyes on Earth while they were still in its orbit, and Cersei said, it's beautiful, isn't it? Beautiful. The same word Icarus taught himself to say in Akkadian or Babylonian, whatever version of the language it was back then, to Cersei the day that he proposed. And so he fulfills his mythological destiny and flies way too close to the sun. Like, like way too close. Like, into it. But despite this final conflict, Cersei can't help but feel grateful to the celestial she just killed on the day of its birth, crediting it for her successful Unimind link. She says, Tiamat joined our Unimind. We became one, even with Icarus and Sprite, and that's all because of Tiamat. Just interesting to think that Tiamat might have been okay with what Cersei was doing to it. Like, not all celestials are on board with Erishim's way of doing things, and might be more willing to grant the underlings, like the Eternals, more free will. Just gives us hope for whatever celestial Eros is about to summon with his sphere, answering the question of this movie's premise, our original purposes can be and should be defied for love. And in the post credit scene we learn, it's all thanks to the god of love. Cersei turns Sprite human, allowing her the chance to grow into an adult and live the mortal life she always wanted. A happy ending from another classic fairy tale, Pinocchio and the Blue Fairy. And there are no strings on her. Hey, that's an Ultron thing. Thena departs Earth on the Domo alongside Druig and Makari. They're all seeking out Eternals on other planets, while Kingo, Sprite, and Cersei stay on Earth. But in the final scene, as Dane begins to tell Cersei that his family history is complicated and that it is his birthright to be the Black Knight, clouds form in the sky and Eric Shem appears, zipping Cersei up to him along with Fastos and Kingo, telling them, you have chosen to sacrifice a celestial for the people of this planet. I will spare them, but your memories will determine if they are worthy to live, and I will return in judgment, allowing Erishem to complete his arc to become his title from the comics, Erishem the Judge. So this way, the film kind of leaves it open-ended whether humanity is worthy of its salvation, almost like a challenge to us to earn our right to exist. Now, if the movie Eternals didn't speak to you, it's totally okay. But is it the worst Marvel movie? Hell no, my friends. This film's deeper themes hit me hard, and I believe we will see the benefits of its contributions for years to come in the MCU. But I want to know your thoughts on the film in the comments below. You can support New Rockstars by checking out our merch options at NewRockstarsMerch.com. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EAVoss, follow New Rockstars, and subscribe for breakdowns of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye.